I'd like first, uh, although I'm talking here about management and a concise model, I'm also going to really uh, join the link between leadership and management. And so what I want to do is to define what leadership is. I um, want to then, very importantly, discuss leadership approaches as distinct from styles, and we'll talk about that. Then look at some practical leadership. How do you do it? And then I'll come back to reiterate the models that we talked about right at the beginning, and they're actually on page one of the workbook. So what we're going to talk about is page seven of the workbook, but actually the models that we're now readdressing are on, and ultimately those models are the concise models, if you like, the concise model, um, are back on page one of the workbook. So I want to go through those four things, leadership, the leadership approaches, practical leadership, and then reiterate and talk a little bit about the models. So the first thing, I guess, is that often management is considered old-fashioned. There's lots of ideas, lots of commentators writing about the idea that we don't need managers today. And it's an interesting concept that of many companies who've tried it. There's many people who've said, we don't have managers. We've got cooperative individuals. Uh, it's an interesting idea because somebody has to give those cooperative individuals the actual um, the, the, the tasks and objectives, and we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, so it's an interesting concept, and I think a lot of it has come from the idea that management itself is pedestrian, leadership is all exciting, and that's where it's all about. And of course, really today, we want to talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. So we have to be a bit clear about what management is, what leadership is, and what entrepreneurship is. Let's start with entrepreneurs. They're the ones with the ideas. Let's let's say that the entrepreneurs typically start a company. They're the, they're the people that perhaps have an idea which might be uh, able to be taken to market. So what's the difference then between the other two, management and leadership? The essence of management is that a manager is a person who takes responsibility for the actions and outcomes of other people. That is it. That is what a manager does. And in, in a sense, it's a self-elected role. The manager says, I am doing this. Uh, they may well be appointed, of course, but it, they are actually stepping up to the, to, the, to the podium. They're stepping up to the mark and saying, I'm responsible. The leadership, leadership, on the other hand, is the influencing of other people towards you, your point of view as leader. So you can be a leader as a product manager, although you're not actually, perhaps a bad example, let's say a product uh, specialist. You can be a, a leader as a product specialist without actually being a manager of people, without actually taking responsibility for the development team, without actually taking responsibility for the outcome. But you can provide product leadership. And so the two are quite distinct. So in a sense, I want to try and drive a wedge between management as something where people are responsible for the actions and outcomes of others and leadership as something where you're influencing others. And I've mentioned entrepreneurship as well. So at the end of the day, it's fundamental to all companies to have managers, those who take responsibility. It's fundamental also to take to have those who are leaders, who are influencing others. We're going to focus now for the next little bit on leaders. So what is leadership all about? Well, it's the idea of setting goals. It's the idea of uh, setting personal goals, and it's the idea of foreseeing something where you're going to go to and set certain actions in place. And uh, this is, I suppose, at this point, we're blurring a little bit between um, management and, and leadership. Management being the idea that you would set the goals, um, and you're going to set a target ahead and attempt to achieve. And what I tried to show with the diagram on the uh, the right hand side there is that it's not always a straight line very often things happen um every day things happen things happen to change what you might those outcomes might otherwise be and so the action of a manager is about readjusting 
in this case, the metaphor is the uh, the yacht. We're constantly readjusting the uh, sailing position of the yacht in order to ultimately get where we actually want to go to. Um, so it's practically, management is practically about goals and practically about personal goals for the individuals. So manager is actually distilling down from an overall organization goal down into specific goals that you're going to assign to individuals. Um, so leadership, on the other hand, we've seen this idea that we had before where as an individual, for an individual, we have a job that that individual does. That job motivates, and we saw that there were a few other things that impinges upon the motivation, but in essence, we've got a job that motivates. That motivation creates a behavior. That behavior, if it's favorable, favorable behavior, creates performance. And of course, that then allows us to see the leadership playing on motivation. So let's just jump back and define what motivation is. Motivation is the in-person process that causes somebody to start some action, gives them direction that they're going to go forward in that action, determines how much effort they're going to put in and how persistent they are going to be, and it also determines what the, uh, the, whether or not they'll stop and whether they'll change action to something else. So here's this thing called motivation, and leadership is playing on motivation. So in essence, that is the activity of, of leadership. That's what leadership is doing. And so what we're trying to do with leadership is to influence, and leadership is an action of influencing. It's influencing that motivation. The essentials of leadership, of course, come. we have to go back to almost to management to look at the essentials of leadership because you might ask, well, how do I lead? lead? It's, it's, we've been asked before by someone who said, well, look, I'm a new, a new in the post. What do I do? What do I actually do to lead? And of course, even if you're a product specialist and you're not actually a manager with accepting responsibility, in the end, you have to have plans, initiatives, and some kind of expectations. It's almost like if you've got nothing to do, if you have no plans, if you have no initiatives, then there's nothing to lead. There's no, there's no influencing to be done because there's no point in influencing. If you have no plans, then what's the point in influencing other employees towards your point of view such that those plans get met. So if you like, the start point of anything to do with leadership is that there must be plans, initiatives, expectations. There must be something to do. Now, you can sit and think a little bit about the uh, the business of, let's say, it's business as usual as opposed to uh, change. If it's business as usual, even then, it's almost as though Leadership has little to do. Leadership only has to sustain the status quo as opposed to make change. So the question really is, how do we do leadership? Yes, we've got to have these plans. Yes, we've got to have initiatives. So it's almost like management meeting, sit down, write out the plans, write out the initiatives that we wish to create in order to have these long-term objectives, in order to have those long-term goals, and we then need to do something to cause this to happen. So we've got our plans. What do we actually have to do? And there are three, I'm going to give you three very practical actions that are, are a host. And I'm going to say that they are actually um, – we're going to talk in a bit about approaches and styles – these that I'm going to talk about now are tactics. They are the tactics of the leader, and they'll fit inside different uh, approaches. But what I want to talk about is three very specific tactics. The first is a thing called obstacle removal. Now, in addressing those three, there are a lot. So you will need to uh, go offline and research other tactics. But here's one. Everybody in their day-to-day -day job finds they've got obstacles. It's very simple for a uh, member of, of, of uh, your staff to find that they 
are trying to do something, they're tr- contributing to one of those plans, one of those initiatives, and they find themselves with difficulty. It could be, for example, that a member of another team won't cooperate with you for one reason or other. They won't cooperate with the employee. And that person is getting frustrated because they can't get the cooperation. The leader is generally in a management position. The leader is often in a position of power. And therefore, that leader can go to the, let's say, the manager of the other group and say, look, why is it that your your, uh, um, young lady, your young chap is not cooperating? We do need to get this cooperation. How about we actually agree that this is going to happen? The other manager says, yes, that's a good idea. You come back to your member of staff and say, I've had a word, should be okay now, approach the member of staff again. At that point, you as the employee approaches the member of staff. They say, yeah, 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 Uh, I've just had a word with my manager and he's okay about this. Um, And suddenly the obstacle's gone. The blockage has gone. And so often that happens because, of course, the leader is in a position of power, is in a position of greater knowledge, and can therefore facilitate the removal of an obstacle. And that's the first tactic. If all you did was go about your normal daily work every day as a leader, removing obstacles might be a bit boring, but actually you would be an effective leader because you would be causing your followers to be able to do their job. So that's the first tactic. The second tactic is known as goal illumination. Now, this one, I suppose, again, a bit pretty obvious. You've got goals. Each individual has goals. The organization has goals. And so it's obvious and useful for the leader to go into the the staff group and every day, okay, again, it might get a little bit boring every day, but Every day, shall we say, they will go in and they will remind the followers, remind the people of the particular goals. Now, of course, by being reminded of the goals, that comes into the the focus of the individuals and they will start to make plans to meet those goals. So again, a tactic, simply, don't forget, we have to, we have to get through ISO 9001 in two months' time. Uh, we do need to remember that. Remember, you've all got objectives and constantly ev- illuminating those goals and also simplifying them and showing the individuals how they will get there, how they will achieve the goals. Often goals, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll meet ISO 9001. Poof. Okay. How? We're not actually saying how. So often the leader will elaborate the goal and elaborate the method of achieving the goal. So there's another one that if all you actually did every day was go in and illuminate the goals, you would actually be quite an effective leader. Uh, Again, you might be a bit bored and people might get a bit fed up with you constantly coming in first thing in the morning, but nonetheless, you would be, that's an effective tactic. The final one is a thing called LMX, Leader Member Exchange, which goes, has it that very simple, we've we've actually talked about this exchange theory, Um, the idea that the leader, and particularly the leader as manager, the leader is in a position of power and can satisfy the member, the followers needs. And so, for example, for personal growth, the leader is in a position to assist the uh, the follower in their personal growth, and it might be something. For example, um, it may be that the individual, is, the follower, is interested in becoming a member of some international committee. Uh, there's an opportunity for that, and the manager can facilitate that make that appointment, give that person the time because they've got control of the money, give that person the time. The person then gets what they want, which is the membership of the committee, the, the, uh, let's, let's speculate and say it's international travel or whatever. The member is very happy. The leader is, the, the follower is very happy about that. They got what they wanted. Now there's an exchange here because the manager as leader is now expecting action and cooperation from that individual and leader that the the exchange theory of course has it that 
that's that's quite obvious. That's quite obvious that there's always an expectation that if something is given, something is going to be wanted in return. And people, it's found that in research, people are very happy to provide that that um, that quid pro quo. So there we have it. The third one, leader member exchange, the idea of meeting follower needs by granting them things, but of course expecting in return. Uh, action and followership from the followers. So those are f- some tactics. There are lots more. Those tactics ball up into approaches. And if you like, baskets of, of tactics become approaches. And I've put four approaches down here. There are lots more. But uh, if you look at the approaches, we've got a professional approach, which might be relevant for a school with teachers. So the head, headmistress, head, head, head teacher might be uh, um, following a professional approach. Now, the professional approach is one that um, it would, in that case, the head teacher would be working with the individual teachers to help them to uh, build their curriculum, help them to deliver the, the lesson plans, help them to deliver the lessons, help them to become good teachers. And that would be their approach. There is no presumption here that the head, te- the head teacher, if you like, is, is purely a first among equals. They are not so far ahead of the teachers themselves. And so there is a professional approach, a professional attitude between the two. There is not this this huge power difference. Everyone is expected to be very good at their job, and the head teacher is expected to be a very good teacher as well in order to provide that impression, uh, that uh, leadership that comes from being a competent teacher in your own right, trying to influence other teachers to do their job. And the same would be true of engineers. You really need to be to run an engineering company. Arguably, you should be a very good engineer. If you are going to be a lawyer, you should be a very good lawyer in order to do that, Um, or at least a competent lawyer, shall we say. There are the other three there. If we take managerial approach, for example, managerial approach is typically, and you might call it procedural approach, where the procedures within the company are what make the company work, and therefore leadership is all about having the individuals in the company meet those procedures. And everything, even LMX, for example, Leader Manage Exchange, would be all driven at making sure that individuals meet follow those procedures. And the whole company is procedurally based. Now, that's that's appropriate in that managerial approach. That's appropriate for that type of company. It wouldn't be appropriate for, for example, the school. And so what we have to do is to match the approach to the environment. We must understand the company. Uh, and we must match the uh, approach. Um, I'll, I won't talk much about transformational, charismatic. The kind of the idea of what they are is in the words charismatic and transformational. Transformational is big change. A lot about vision, espousing great vision. And a point to make here is that if you were, for example, trying to turn around a failing school, you might indeed start with a charismatic or transformational approach and then move as the school slowly gets better and changes you might move to become a professional approach for example you might actually have to persuade the parents that uh, the, the start point was to persuade the parents and get the kids to turn up and that might be charismatic um, and then what's needed is to get the teachers to perform, in which case you stop being charismatic and you move over to the professional approach. So just to say that the approach should match the environment and the manager stroke leader should always be sensing this, this match between the two and adjusting. A word about styles. In essence, there are only two styles, well, maybe three. Um, there's the directive style, which is the tell style, which you can use inside any of the approaches. Sometimes it's appropriate to simply tell people, and other times it's a more directive approach that's needed. In other words, you're convincing them of the usefulness of doing that without, uh, and in essence, they realize the usefulness without actually being told to do it. And that's a much more subtle and much more 
energy sapping <laughs> uh, style. Uh, the non-directive style is is much more subtle. The other one, other style, which is a non-style, is the kind of laissez-faire thing, which is almost that there is no leadership at all, um, and that also mirrors some of the other approaches where you would actually take a hands-off leadership approach. But we, we we won't go off into those. In essence, there are four approaches there. Uh, that I'm introducing in two styles. So that's the, the if you like, that's leadership in a nutshell. nutshell. But what should we be doing as a leader? And I think the essence of le- the leadership is, I, in fact, we've talked about it before, where the leader should be leading a relatively small number of people. That does not mean uh, that, so, so for example, here I've got a section, a military section of eight soldiers in my ring. And there is, in this case, it would be eight soldiers and a corporal who um, comprise a section. You would then have eight sections in a company. You'd have eight eight companies in a, in a, a battalion, eight battalions in a, a regiment. And you would end up with a lieutenant colonel managing and leading, um, in this case, 256 men and women. And so you see this, what, what, what I've called the rule of eights. A leader, manager can have a useful job themselves for, let's say, 50% of the time doing specific things, provided that they are making available and they're not trying to manage not trying to lead more than something like eight now in some organizations it'll be two and in some organizations it'll be 30 but eight is a good balance and research has shown that typically in that environment with a leader and eight subordinates and of course leader with eight subordinates who perhaps themselves have eight who perhaps themselves have eight and so we have a cascade um, we typically spend 50 percent of their time with those direct reports, and 50% of the email traffic would be within that group and from the, those uh, those direct reports. So you get the idea there of the of the instrumentality, the the importance of the manager as leader managing that group. Uh, so a quick word there about how it practically works. Uh, and of course, if you take the the manager away, then that structure would no longer exist, in which case we can then have a discussion about what replaces it. That's for another day. In terms of, uh, just before we wrap up, um, in terms of manager and how you would, the modern thoughts of it, typically things haven't changed. It's funny how things come around. The fundamental uh, management teaching from about the 1970s, 1980s, was manager as facilitator, Today, we've got manager as a mentor. So we've got this idea that the manager as leader, the manager is mentoring their people. And of course, that requires them to get close. Uh, one of the big mistakes made by leaders is to have a, a physical difference in distance or indeed a metaphoric distance between the followers and the leader, between the manager and their people. Fundamentally, to manage people, to influence people, you've got to get get up close and personal. You've got to actually inf- talk to them and communicate with them, with them, in order to influence them. So that's, if you like, the the how of it all. That brings us back just to wrap up with the ideas we had before. What is this thing called management? The answer is that we are. We have a person who, if you manage, imagine is the box. We have in-personal, in-person mental and physical processes going on with that person. And the manager is intervening in that person's life. They're doing things. And nothing happens if they don't do things. Nothing happens in the business uh, and you don't achieve the aims. So you've got this idea of intervening. You're making plans. You're persuading you're intervening now there's an awful lot of stuff that goes on and i've called it here stuff that moderates there's an awful lot of things that go on for example culture that will actually influence how that person reacts to those interventions and that is ultimately the skill of the manager and at the end of it uh, with the person performing we've had all this these discussions we get the business outcomes 
And probably the most important model for all managers is the feedback control model. We have to have an idea of a reference performance that we'd like to see from each person. We have to sense what the performance is, and we have to develop interventions to make change and recover the situation that we want, recover the performance that we want. So there we go. Um, we'll wrap up at that point. Uh, the universal model, I suppose, in that case, are the two last models, the feed forward model with the interventions and the feedback control model uh, with the idea of sensing and control. Um, my argument so, certainly is that management and leadership are synonymous. Leaders manage, management, managers lead. Hang on, let me get that. Managers lead, leaders manage in most cases, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you can have a leader who is not actually taking that responsibility for the performance of individuals. It's all about pursuit of goals, and there are methods, there are approaches, tactics, and it's, in the end of the day, sensing what works and doing more of it, and sensing what doesn't work and doing less. And there we have it. Back to you.